This is the nature of things. Qingdao Beach in northern China. 70,000 people are trying to cool off. Here, swimmers are taking on a bizarre new look. These face kinis are protection against a growing menace, jellyfish. Like these swimmers, we think of them with fear and fascination. Strange and wonderful, there's more to these alien-looking creatures than you ever could have imagined. Hypnotically beautiful, they drift around on the ocean currents. But swimmers beware. They can sting, and some can even kill you. Jellyfish, or jellies as some scientists prefer, have been around longer than almost any other creature, and it looks like they might be taking over. What does that mean for the future of the world's oceans? Ethereal. Mysterious, fragile. That's one part of the jellyfish story. This is the other part, the one some scientists fear will be the future. Oceans saturated with ever multiplying blooms of jellyfish. One of the scientists who thinks our future is full of jellies is Lucas Bratz. They look delicate, but jellies are one of the most indestructible creatures our planet has ever seen. The thing that really fascinates me about jellyfish is that they're incredibly simple organisms. No brain, uh, no heart, no blood. And yet, I mean, they've lived through all the great extinctions. I think jellyfish will be around um, for a long time, probably much longer than humans. When he's not at the University of British Columbia, Canada's foremost jelly researcher studies them from his own backyard in the coastal mountains. Here the jelly known as lion's mane holds sway, even in these cold waters. Recently, Bratz and his colleagues made a splash with a study showing jelly populations are growing in most of the world's coastal oceans. Jellyfish can thrive in pretty much every ocean on Earth, from the surface all the way to the bottom, from the Arctic to the tropics. You know, we're seeing increased blooms in more and more places around the world. Jellyfish are showing up earlier, sticking around for longer, expanding their ranges. When jellies appeared almost 600 million years ago, the continents as we know them hadn't formed. Long before human beings, dinosaurs, even fish existed, these translucent blobs ruled the planet. For most of us, jellies are bizarre and fantastic creatures. Many of the over 1,200 species have bells and tentacles and weapons that kill. They have no brain, no backbone, but these primordial beings seem to be thriving in today's oceans. Brat says that should worry us. I think it's a signal that things are changing in the marine environment. And for other species, and potentially for humans, these changes aren't positive. Massive numbers of them, called blooms, have shut down nuclear power plants, ruined fisheries, closed beaches around the world. Finding ways to protect ourselves against them won't be easy. Among the most feared, Pelagia. 
pretty and poisonous, they sting almost two million people every year in the Mediterranean. Now, they're posing a new threat. Marine biologist Tom Doyle will never forget his first sight of a Pelagia bloom near Ireland. I began to see these large swarms of jellyfish where you had tens of thousands, even millions of individuals, because the Pelagia bloom that I saw was com mostly composed of tiny little individuals that may be 14 millimeters in size. You know, we'd see them over kilometers and kilometers, just, just huge aggregations. The bloom was heading toward the northern Irish coast and a fish farm with hundreds of thousands of salmon. If the jellies came in contact with the fish, it would be disastrous. A month after Tom saw the bloom, it reached the farm. People described the water being colored golden brown. It was just, there was that many of them. Millions of poisonous jellies swept through the mesh and into the pens, alongside thousands of salmon that had nowhere to go. So these jellyfish were using up the oxygen in the water. But the biggest impact, it was that the water is completely covered in these small jellyfish. They're gonna be taking jellyfish into their mouth and through their gills. There was so much venom that was pumped into these fish that they actually, they were killed by the jellyfish. Within hours, 100,000 salmon were dead. The farm shut down. But it wasn't really the jelly's fault, says Doyle. The jellyfish are not attacking the salmon. It's just these jellyfish are being carried. It was strong winds and it was tides and it was a strong current. You know, there was a lot of dif different things that had to stack up before this farm got wiped out. Small comfort for fish farmers. Farms around the world have been hit by blooms and massive losses. The thing that makes jellyfish so deadly is the thing that allows a sack of jelly, their 95% water, to capture and eat crabby crustaceans and feisty fish. A powerful but invisible weapon venom. No one in the world knows more about jellyfish venom than Hawaiian biochemist Angel Yanagihara. Eighteen years ago, she was almost killed by a swarm of jellyfish. Now she's getting even by unlocking the secrets of the jelly sting. It's not a simple individual injection like a mosquito bite. This is literally thousands to tens of thousands to even 100,000 of these microscopic stinging cells along the length of the sting. When you look at it from the microscopic point of view, you can see that the amount of physical trauma that actually occurs is pretty phenomenal. Jellyfish tentacles are covered with millions of capsules of explosive harpoons filled with venom. So you can see the little raised welts there, little buttons. Each of those has a number of stinging cells, all poised and ready to discharge. At the slightest disturbance, they fire. It's a deadly double-barreled assault. The prey's blood cells are pierced. Their contents flood out. Essentially what happens is you have short-circuiting of the whole muscular system. If you have a massive increase in plasma potassium, game over, so the heart cannot beat. At the same time, the harpoon injects venom into its prey. The venom then actually starts digesting it immediately. These uh, compounds basically jumpstart the whole digestive process. We see something we'd like to eat, we put it in our mouth, we chew it, we take it into our stomach. Those rules do not apply in jellyfish world at all. In the jellyfish world, paralyzing, killing, and digesting prey has to happen fast. If it doesn't, the jelly can be torn apart by the thing it's trying to eat. 
Because they digest food so quickly, some jellies grow at an amazing rate. The biggest of them, the lion's mane, has hundreds of tentacles up to 25 meters long. They sting everything from plankton to small fish to unsuspecting swimmers. Three or four of them on the surface oh, this morning. One yeah. of the guys got stung, just around his lips. So. Angel has joined up with Tom Doyle in Ireland. She wants to develop an antidote to the lion's mane venom. Lion's mane, just here. First, she has to find out more about their stinging cells. Perfect. She needs a piece of its tentacle. There's an impressive length of tentacles, look at that. Fantastic. This has been in seawater overnight, okay. so it's a live tentacle. The tempting meal is a slide covered in fish blood. So there you see the tentacle edge. Will the stinging cells fire? Oh look, there's so, yeah, one just there's discharged. One, yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is gorgeous, look at that. Yeah. All these fine hairs then are the tubules that are injecting the venom into the blood. But lion's mane is full of surprises, even for Angel. Why didn't these mysterious cells fire? It's because jellies are masters of death. Each deploys weapons called nide that are specifically designed for their prey. Harpoons for the fish eaters. Lassoes for tough skin crustaceans. A fine sticky mesh for the plankton eaters. Because it eats everything, lion's mane uses all of them. Frankly, I was quite amazed at the diversity of nide in the lion's mane. It's basically, um, you know, kind of like the, the iPhone, there's an app for that. While Angel tries to tame the lion's mane, Tom Doyle is trying to protect the fish farms. Jelly venom is so powerful that even small amounts in the water can cause infections in farm fish. Tom Doyle and his colleague believe they have found the solution. Compressed air is pumped through a five meter long pipe. It produces a wall of bubbles. As the bubbles are going up to the surface, they create this fast uh, flow of water. So as the jellyfish come along, they just get caught and, and pushed out away from the cage. So that's the theory. Today, the theory is put to the test. They release a moon jelly. The result isn't long in coming. So they're being pushed with the current, um, just a natural current in the water. And then as they approach the bubble curtain system, you just see them just being caught and just swept up to the surface. A simple test with big implications. It was, it was brilliant, it was fantastic, because potentially this, this could be a solution that um, may keep these big super swarms out of, the, out of the aquaculture cages. But Doyle doesn't see jellies as the enemy. He worries their natural place in the ecosystem is being overshadowed by their new reputation as the troublemakers of the sea. People have to be aware that jellyfish are part of natural systems. They've always been there. They've been there longer than ourselves and all the vertebrates. So I think they have a better chance than us. <laughs> I've been around in 600 million years. How could one of the oldest creatures on Earth become one of its greatest threats? July in the Gulf of Alaska, the jellies are in bloom. Hundreds of thousands of moons are feasting on plankton. The lion's mane are here too. A bloom like this can clear the water of other creatures in hours. It's not very many predators, believe it or not, in the water that can actually depress the population size of its 
prey, and jellyfish are able to do that. And so that's gonna make them, by default, a dominant predator. How did a bunch of aimless drifters make it to the top of the food chain? It turns out jellies are neither drifters nor aimless. Scientists Sean Colon and Jack Costello think the way jellies move is key to their success as predators. At Woods Hole in Massachusetts, they're using a high-tech laser system to look at jellyfish propulsion. The laser creates a special light field. It lets them see both the jelly's motion and the movement of particles in the water. So it's got, swim, it's swimming right through the field, it's got good motion, good particle field. Back at the Marine Biological Laboratory, they run the images through a program that tracks the particles. Look at all that mo water he's moving as he's pulsing the bell. They immediately notice a little swirl of water that's produced when the jelly relaxes its bell. Underneath, there's this swirling that we see that is kind of moving at that counterclockwise direction. That little swirl gives jellies a big boost. A third of their forward motion is achieved without them having to move a muscle. In fact, what we've recently found is that they are probably the most efficient animal that moves. Jellyfish are actually more efficient than fish. They've figured out how to get the most by doing the least. Moving lots of water with the least amount of effort is the key to jelly's success as predators. This is sort of a cool part here where the tentacles are hanging down and huge flow of water into the tentacles. I mean, that's gotta be used for bringing food all the way in. I mean, they're really using the flow, not just for propulsion, but it seems like they're really using it to feed and to capture prey. For jellyfish, swimming and eating are the same thing. For their purposes, swimming is not necessarily about going someplace. It's about moving water, and it's fulfilling that role perfectly. But for a jellyfish that's moving to capture prey, water motion itself is the end. If they're moving, they're eating, and they're moving all the time. These kinds of jellies are known as cruising predators. You, you normally consider jellyfish as just bags of water. They drift with the currents. We now know that jellyfish can have a very active component, that they're actually searching for prey in much the same way as fish. So 24-7, these jellyfish, you will see them moving up and down continuously. To find out more about how jellies find and follow prey, Tom Doyle is going fishing. They're not like any jellyfish you're, 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 most people be familiar with. The barrel jellyfish are a completely different animal. At up to a meter wide and 30 kilograms in weight, barrel jellies are big, powerful swimmers. And although they have no tentacles to sting and capture prey, barrels are perfect plankton-eating machines. There's a large uh, bell, and then hanging out underneath that, you have these oral arms. Effectively, looks like cauliflower, which have thousands of tiny mouths. It's almost like the vacuum cleaner, they're sucking in all the plankton. Jellies can form large groups to search out and consume prey with sometimes devastating results. But how these creatures with no brain, eyes, or ears do it is a mystery. How do they stay together? So like a flock of birds, and you see the flock of birds are, are a shoal of fish moving around together. How does a jellyfish do that? The jellyfish are very simple animals. So how do they coordinate amongst themselves, or do they? Tom hopes the barrels will help him find the answer. It's a good one, though. It's a good size, yeah. The most common way of tracking animals is to attach a tag. So today, he's going to tag some jellyfish. They're about five meters out now from us. We want to try and uh, get out there, catch several of them. So we want to track a whole load of individuals at the same time. Do they stay together or do they move apart over time? 
Tom uses a snorkel rather than scuba gear to do the tagging. It means he must grab and tag the barrel in less than a minute. If the jelly is too far down, he has to coax it up to the surface. And when jellies sense danger, they dive. Tom gets the cable around the jelly and attaches an acoustic tag. Pings will be picked up by receivers on the seabed. The barrel swims away, none the worse for wear. One down, only a dozen or so to go. But Doyle is a happy marine biologist. Fantastic. Oh, really good. It turns out jellies can take over entire ecosystems, especially when they get some help from us. That's what happened in the Black Sea at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. By the early 80s, it was in trouble. Its rich fishing grounds had been depleted. Then a tanker from North America dumped some ballast water and unleashed an egg-sized blob of jelly called Nemeopsis. A deadly invasion had begun. The Black Sea um, is a, an ecosystem that was already stressed due to um, overfishing pollution. Um, and it seemed like the Nemeopsis was a tipping point. Nemeopsis is a comb jelly. They have no bell, no tentacles, and no stinging cells. Rows of hair-like cilia propel them through the water and create stunning light shows. This enchanting little jelly is one of the toughest, deadliest, hungriest creatures on the planet. They don't get full. They will continue to eat. And if there's more food there, they won't digest the food. They have. They'll spit out the dead food that they've eaten. They don't basically know how to stop eating. This was very bad news for the Black Sea, where Nemeopsis had no natural predators. And with a fish population on the brink of collapse, virtually no competitors either. They were like kids in a candy store, I think, over there, because uh, there wasn't any competition to challenge them. Nemeopsis can capture 90% of the prey that is in the water. It's a rate few other predators in the world can match. Nemeopsis is the ultimate stealth hunter. Those lovely but lethal cilia are its secret weapon. This is Nemeopsis here. And this is how it took over the Black Sea. Copepods are basically swimming antenna, and they're very effective at detecting fluid disturbances. They're extremely fast. They can escape at 900 body lengths per second, and so they're very good at evading predation. The jelly can sense the copepods. It produces a slow current to draw its prey towards it. So slow, even a copepod can't detect it until it's too late. It's trapped in the jelly's sticky lobe. They wiped out the zooplankton, the basis of the food chain, and the fish vanished. It's like taking all the grass off of a meadow and then all the cows die because there's nothing for them to eat. And there are documented declines in the billions of dollars in terms of how it impacted the local fisheries. With each jelly laying up to 10,000 eggs a day, the population exploded. The invaders had taken over. Then an unlikely savior showed up, another even deadlier comb jelly, released in yet another batch of ballast water. Baroi, as it's called, is basically a swimming mouth. It can't stop eating either. But it eats only one thing, its relative, Nemeopsis. After swallowing its prey, Baroi zips its big mouth shut and hooks the still living jelly in place to digest it. 
So they basically only eat Nemeopsis, and when all the Nemeopsis go, all the Baroe die, basically. The Black Sea had been saved from one jellyfish by another, a lucky break. But Nemeopsis is being spread in ballast water to new oceans. It's one tough jelly. Researchers in Martindale's lab are finding out just how tough. How do these seemingly fragile creatures survive being pumped into and out of ships? To replicate that, the jellies are cut in half. They shrug it off. Within an hour, the wound has healed. Within days, the missing half has regrown. Nemeopsis is now considered one of the most invasive species in the world. I think humans are definitely creating situations that are beneficial for jellyfish. It's a very disturbing trend. We're creating less favorable habitats for the things that have been there recently by overfishing and pollution. Um, so in some cases, this is a direct benefit for jellyfish. And in other cases, it basically releases them from predation or competition, and therefore they can thrive. Jellyfish aren't just tough. They can even cheat death. In the animal kingdom, two things are essential for making it to the top, getting food and having sex. When it comes to making babies, jellies do it in a remarkable number of ways. Some do it all by themselves. A few do it together. They release eggs and sperm into the water. The result, baby jellies by the millions. But most jellies do it differently. They create tiny organisms called polyps. The polyps latch onto a solid surface and generate enormous colonies by cloning themselves. Months later, an extraordinary change occurs. Each polyp forms a stack of budding baby jellies. One by one, they pull off and swim away. Polyps are jellyfish making machines. Throughout one season, you can have each polyp producing potentially dozens of these baby jellyfish. And if you have a large colony of polyps, that could make for a massive bloom of jellyfish. Massive blooms are now common in China's northern seas. At Qingdao's Institute of Oceanography, Scientists are studying where, when, and why jelly blooms occur. They think the answer lies with the bottom-dwelling polyps. Institute Director Sun Song. The story is in the bottom, not in the surface. For the medusa, the surface may be important, but for the polypus, and polypus stage is most important. Polyps usually hunker down on the underside of rocks. But coastal development could be providing new habitats. Is there a connection between China's building boom and its jellyfish bloom? Two of the study team are taking a look at what lies beneath these massive wharfs. The support girders are covered in marine life. In this water, finding minute polyps is not exactly easy. The researchers pry off likely looking chunks. Now it's back to the lab to see what they've got. What looked like a dirty piece of rock comes alive under the microscope. Look, 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 oh, the polyps. polyps, so many polyps. It's covered in hundreds of moon jelly polyps. Oh, this one is large, really large, I think. Oh, it's eight, eight hundred. <laughs> hey, here is a, a very huge polo system, I think. If there isn't enough food, they can turn into cysts to wait it out until things get better, even if it takes years. 
Wow. Almost near two millimeters. They find at least 40 polyps per square centimeter. A single structure is home to polyps that can produce millions of jellies. It turns out the wharf is a jellyfish factory. Once again, we seem to be giving jellies a helping hand. Not that they need it. No food, no problem. Jellies can go for weeks without eating. Many actually degrow, like an adult human getting smaller and shorter. Then they get big again when there's food. Of all the unique and astonishing ways jellies have developed to survive, the most incredible is the ability to defy death. There are many legends, but no one has ever become young again. Now we know creatures that can rejuvenate themselves really to exist in this world. The creatures are called Turritopsis. Inside their transparent bell, along with a large red stomach, lies the secret to immortality. At Kyoto University's marine laboratory, Kubota spends hours a day tending his tiny treasures. But he doesn't want them to be completely healthy. Turritopsis reveals its secret only when it thinks it's dying. To induce this, Kubota damages the jelly. When it gets severely injured, a direction to revert back is issued. But no one knows how the direction is issued. Cells that aren't needed automatically die. Other cells turn from jellyfish cells back into polyp cells. Instead of dying, it turns back into a polyp. It's as if a butterfly escaped death by becoming a caterpillar. After a few days, the polyp produces buds that will become new jellyfish. This rejuvenation can only be done by Turritopsis and by no other organism in the world. It is amazing. The jellyfish never really dies. Theoretically, it can rejuvenate endlessly. It is immortal. Against all laws of nature, his colony has rejuvenated itself ten times in two years. Kubota believes these ancient creatures are far more complex and resilient than we have ever realized. And he has no doubt that in the struggle for survival in the ocean, jellies will be the ultimate victors. It is the best in terms of reproduction and genetic structure. I don't see a better form of life. With immortality, they can't lose. <laughs> Have we created the perfect storm for a jellyfish takeover of our oceans? It's been a long time since Darien, Georgia, was the southernmost outpost of the British Empire in North America. Now, it's a village built on shrimp. But in an all too familiar story, the fishing isn't as good as it used to be. These days, a lot of boats stay tied up. But at least one fishing trawler is charting a new course. Starting in the summertime on Daddy's boat, shrimp boat. Everybody's a shrimper. It's rock, rock hard, in your blood. In the recent years, people are getting away from it. Just like last year was a disaster. You know, nobody made any money, and you got bills, you got house payments, car payments, boat payments. Fifth generation shrimper Wynn Gale has seen the future and it's jelly balling. I've been doing it, uh, jelly balling, I've been doing it three years. And I like this more than to do shrimping, so. It's the way I like to fish, it's hard and fast. It's, it's, 
Let's all go, 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 go. Jelly balling is what the locals call fishing cannonball jelly. And that's in the kill zone for us. It's right there about six foot down. That's where we want to see them. Adam said they're about six foot down out here. There's a big part of them out here. All right, let's do it. Cannonball jellies are Georgia's newest official fishery. Keeping track of the catch is state marine biologist Jim Page. See the, the pulsation, the bottom of the bell there, it's actually pulsating like a heartbeat. They are very good swimmers. They can actually swim against tides. Just like fish, they'll be very, very close to each other. So they do, they do school quite a bit. In fact, you can see these out here. Blooms as long as 160 kilometers have been reported. They've been around since I can remember, because they're, they're a nuisance to the shrimp boats. So, I mean, they were literally clogging it up to the point where you couldn't even pick it up. You'll have 10 pounds of shrimp and 2,000 pounds of jelly balls just slacking around on the back deck, and it's a nightmare. Now, he's getting even. In 20 minutes, the nets are full. 2,700 kilograms of cannonballs hit the deck. As quickly as they are sloshed into the hold, the nets go out again. Wynn and his crew have been jellyballing almost every day of the seven-month season. Well, I can tell you right now, there ain't no shortage of I ain't never seen this many. There's some more out there this year than I've ever seen in my life. I, it, it's unreal. At only 13 cents a kilogram, he needs a lot of them. Still, he's making more money from jelly balls than shrimp. We're fixing to knock crabbers out of the number two spot in the state. Shrimp is number one. Can't beat shrimp. Now jellyfish is number two problem. Wingale's enthusiasm does not extend to actually eating them. They say it's got some collagen or something in it there to help you skin. It never helped my skin. Of course, I don't eat them. Just never got around to doing it. Just kind of, I don't know. You know, you look at it like that. People don't like us. They, they don't like and the listing is yuck. Up to 500,000 kilograms a week of yuck are unloaded at Terry Chang's processing plant. Actually, they taste nothing. For sure, before anyone eats these jellies, they need to have a little work done. Inside the plant, the jelly is separated in two. People say that they taste like a bubble wrap, but the key is the, the crunch, the texture. To get these critters to crunch, they are treated with Chang's secret salting formula. After a week in the vats, they look like leathery chew toys. The entire catch is headed for Asia, where they are in hot demand. Once again, Little Darien is a gateway to the world. For the Georgia fishers, lots of jellies mean making a living when fish are scarce. For marine scientists, lots of jellies are a sign we're running out of fish and the oceans are in trouble. Are all of our children and our grandchildren gonna be eating jellyfish burgers? Well, I certainly hope not. But, you know, if we don't change our ways and our behavior, that may be all that we have left. In northern China, the future has arrived. Overfishing has wiped out fish stocks and fishermen's livelihoods. Fewer fish means more jellies. In some areas, the places are so overfished that 
it seems they've now switched from being dominated by fish to being dominated by jellyfish. And it can be very hard for the ecosystem to switch back. These are the new rulers of the oceans here, giant nomuras. They used to bloom once every 40 years. Now, it's almost yearly and in larger numbers than ever. So some Chinese have decided, if you can't beat them, eat them. Nomuras were once considered inedible. Now, they are the only catch these fishermen are allowed to haul in. Local villages are surviving on the new jelly fishery. These jellies are ready to eat and sent to the local restaurants fresh off the boat. In China, jellyfish is a popular dish. The most desirable of the dozen edible species of jellies have been fished out. So now, they're dining on jellies that nobody wanted. But no one here really believes they can eat their way through that many jellies. These marine biologists are trying to find ways to control the Nomura population. They're heading into the open ocean to find one. Wrestling a hundred kilo jelly on board is not for the faint of heart. Nor is looking for its reproductive organs in a mass of tentacles and jelly. A mature female can release up to a billion eggs into the water. Solving the problem of Nomura blooms is a bit like trying to get a grip on one of them. Neither quick nor easy. And the problem is much bigger than jellyfish. China's northern seas are some of the most disturbed ecosystems on the planet. Pollution has triggered massive algal blooms and dead zones. Bad news for many animals, but not for jellies. China has concluded the fault lies not with jellies, but with us. It is because we destroy the structure and the function of the ecosystem, so the jellyfish find the opportunity to bloom. Our behavior has changed the oceans in ways that allow jellyfish to thrive. Global warming combined with overfishing, combined with pollution and coastal development with new structures for polyps, that's really giving jellyfish a leg up, as it were. Scientists are worried we are recreating the ancient oceans where jellies once ruled. So we don't want to make jellyfish out to be villains, right? They're um, beautiful organisms. They perform a lot of important functions in the marine environment. And I think we need to pay more attention to jellyfish and perhaps listen to what they're saying. I mean, we all depend on the oceans for our lives, you know? So we really need to start taking better care of it and paying more attention to the changes that are occurring. There's one thing the scientists all agree on. The jellies will be here long after we're gone.